webinarium liderów tolerancji, liderów i liderek tolerancji. Dzisiaj będziemy gościć nauczycieli z, ze szkoły z St. Louis, z Mapelut, Richmond Heights. Opowiedzą, jak, jak pracują w swojej szkole, dokładnie co i jak będą mówić, oczywiście już opowiedzą sami. Ja jestem przedstawicielką Centrum Edukacji Obywatelskiej i powiem tylko trzy słowa o tym, jak działa platforma. Najważniejsze dla Państwa, najważniejsze dla Państwa jest czat, który już właśnie rozpoczęła Pani Krystyna. Jeżeli, jeżeli będą Państwo mieli jakieś pytania do nas, ale zwłaszcza do prowadzących, to właśnie proponuję skorzystać z czatu. Na czacie będzie też Maja Dobiasz, koordynatorka projektu, która w razie potrzeby będzie, będzie tłumaczyła trudniejsze zagadnienia, więc też można prosić na przykład na czacie, żeby coś przetłumaczyć, powtórzyć. Do czego zachęcamy? Zachęcamy w ogóle do aktywności i do korzystania z, z tego, że mamy, że mamy gości na webinarium. Jeszcze jedna ważna informacja, jeżeli coś będzie źle słychać, coś się będzie zacinać, będą Państwo mieli jakieś problemy techniczne, to albo można napisać na czacie, że jest taki problem, albo skorzystać z emotikonów, które się kryją pod buźką tuż nad czatem. Widać taką buźkę i tam można wybrać koło ratunkowe. To będzie oznaczało, że potrzebują Państwo, yy, państwo jakiegoś technicznego wsparcia i wtedy, i wtedy ja postaram się Państwu pomóc. Webinarium będzie trwało godzinę, będzie ono nagrane, więc też będzie możliwość, yy, możliwość yy, obejrzenia go później. Yy, co jeszcze? A dzisiaj webinarium prowadzi, mamy dwóch prowadzących który już Państwo widzą, co oznacza, że też na czacie będzie się pojawiał zarówno Jason, jak i Michael. Będą też zmieniać, wymieniać się. Takie będziemy mieć dzisiaj urozmaicenie. Ja na tyle wyłączam się, oddaję już głos, głos prowadzącym. So, that's it, it's time for you. I'll finish for a moment. I'm I will just say goodbye to the participants on the end of our uh, our webinar. Okay. Well, thank you and good morning, good day to everyone. Um, Mike and I are both very, very excited to join. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what makes my school interesting and what makes my school unique and some things that I'm very proud of that we've been able to do. And so, um, We'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, I'm from Maplewood Richmond Heights Schools Museum, which um, has, my school has grades two through grades six. In our school building, we have about 530 students who are um, in grades second through sixth grade. Um, our ter in terms of poverty level of our students, we are around 45% um, as far as how we determine levels of poverty here in the states. Um, and so I'm excited to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we um, are doing with, with our kiddos. So if we go to, um, sorry, the, I'm going to skip the, the first, actually I'll move to the first, um, second slide, which is, um, an important quote that we often refer back to whenever we're doing the work that we're doing. And it um, says, we remain inspired by being in the presence of beautiful and important work and ideas. And this is hopefully something that you will see um, come up over and over and over again as I'm talking, because a lot of the work that we are doing truly relates to um, being in the presence of other art forms of different meta, um, different mentors that we can use. And students will often use these to then inspire creativity and curiosity and so forth as we do our work. And so it's important that we create a space for our students where they can be inspired and where they are surrounded by um, beautiful and important pieces of work. And so as we go to the next slide, 
slide three. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about our school, and then we'll talk a little bit about the metaphors that Mike and I will be sharing, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, the work and what it actually looks like within our school as truly a transformative way of um, providing teaching and learning for our students. So the background of our school district, just shortly, um, several years ago, um, our school district was not um, being successful. And so one of the ways that the superintendent um, at the time decided to change the district and move forward with some of the important work that needed to happen was to develop the idea of the metaphors within the school. And so our early childhood center, which has grades K, pre-K through one, they're known as school studio. We are school as museum, MICA school as expedition, and then our high school is school as apprenticeship. But one underlying foundation of all four of the metaphors is inquiry-based learning. And so as I'm talking today, we'll be talking quite a bit about inquiry-based learning and, and this approach to learning rather than students sitting and listening as the teacher gives them all information. Inquiry-based approach to learning, as we believe, is around inviting all of the, um, should I move the camera a bit? Is that better? Okay. As we um, learn more about inquiry-based learning, it's really hands-on. It's giving students ownership and voice in their work and allowing them to really take the lead in their learning. And so the teacher is more of a guide who's helping students to achieve and supporting them and asking the right questions, not necessarily the person who has all of the information. So we'll be talking more about that. On our next slide um, are three books that have been very, very um, influential in our work as a school. We've um, participated in book studies with these three texts as we've explored English learning and what this means to our metaphor. Um, the first is A Whole New Mind, which is by Daniel Pink, and it dives a great deal into curiosity, creativity, and collaboration, which are all hallmarks of our metaphor. The second book is An Ethic of Excellence, which talks about taking learning and then sharing it in a way with others that we can be proud of and that really shows the excellence that, that we are capable of. And then the third book is probably one of my favorite books. Um, it's called Mindset, and it talks quite a bit about the idea of having a growth mindset and thinking outside the box and really pushing ourselves um, to persevere and to think beyond what we feel like we're capable of and to have a growth mindset and to have the idea of we just haven't achieved it yet. And so these three texts have been very, very influential in our work. The next slide, <clears throat> the main part that I want to focus in on is the very top part where it's learning and innovation skills, the four C's. These four C's, the four skills, are mainly our focus with our work with School as Museum. And so through this work, our students, we hope, will achieve critical thinking, participate in communication with their classmates, with their teachers, with their families and community, um, having the opportunity to collaborate and to think through and solve problems together, and then be able to demonstrate creativity as they're problem solving and as they're putting their learning on display. And everything below that, as you can see, the way our learning environment is structured, our classroom spaces, our school spaces, what we do with teachers as far as professional development, and then how our curriculum and how we go about teaching students really sets the stage for that end result with our students. So several years ago, we had the opportunity to partner with several museums in our area, and we participated in a year-long study with um, actual museum staff members, as we as a staff, we're trying to explore what is it that museum staff members actually do. So that as we're talking about school as a museum with our students, we can actually explain and do practices that museums do. And so these five practices 
um, came out of that work. And these are five practices that we try to study in depth in each grade level. And so in grade two, we try to study what collection or what collecting looks like within a museum. And so what that might look like would be students having um, various artifacts all related to one theme that then impact the work that they're doing in classrooms. So the quote that I shared earlier about being in the presence of beauty and, and having inspiration, we may have several different artifacts related to a topic that students are studying. So they may be examples of that work. And the idea is collecting and how we use that collection to inform our work. The second one is exhibit. And so this is really the heart of what we do, which is around taking our learning and then actually doing something with it. And so you'll see a photograph of some students who are in the process of designing an actual exhibit that their class or their grade level would be creating based on what they've learned. So for example, this photograph that students are, that you see there of students, they were in the process of creating a giant map of the world as part of their geography study. And so they learned all of the important skills and all of the necessary information related to geography, related to maps, related to um, longitude and latitude and the important names of the continents and all of those pieces. But then they took that learning and created something as a result of that learning. And so if you can just imagine a giant wall with a huge map of the world on it that was 3D and so it was sticking out from the wall and students were able to track and talk about the different pieces of, of that work that they were able to do. So that's the idea of exhibiting or showing and sharing our work with others. The third is document. And so this is an area, I'll be honest with you, that we are trying to get better at but it's more of documenting the learning process that students go through as they are doing the exhibiting work. And so really looking at the collaboration that students participate in, looking at the uh, different inspirational pieces that we look at, um, the reflection that happens at the end of our work, and so documenting the entire learning process, not just looking at the final end result. The fourth is preservation, and so part of that is keeping examples of student work that can then be shared as an inspiration for later grade levels. And so what we've been trying to do is to keep a certain artifact or a piece of student work that each grade level does each year so that as students move into that next grade level, they have an example of what students were able to create the year before. And then finally, interpretation which really leads to that critical thinking piece. And so inviting community members, inviting um, family members to come in and look at the work that our students have been able to do, and then to then interpret and develop their own understanding based on what our students have been able to create. So that's the idea of interpretation. And we try to model all five of these practices in each of our grade levels, and you'll see that they actually grow in complexity um, from year to year with interpretation really being reserved for our sixth grade students. And so just quickly, um, how do we go about teaching this? We use a curriculum framework called Understanding by Design. And really to give you, we could spend an hour explaining on by design, but just to give you a short idea of what Understanding by Design is, the whole idea of understanding by design is you have your standards, you have your goals, your objectives of what you want students to achieve. But then we also have some really deep questions and some broad ideas that we want students to be able to develop as a result of our work. And so as we're going through the process of creating an exhibit and doing this work, we're trying to answer those important, those big questions that we have for each unit. And so, for example, the geography unit that I talked about that our second grade students were working on, the um, broad objectives around or the enduring understandings that are a part of that learning are really about why is it important to know where the continents are? How can we as individuals interact with other folks just like you and I are doing today? 
And so teaching students the importance, the bigger picture of why they need to know all of those important skills and putting them together to really develop a deeper understanding of the content. And that's something that understanding by design allows us to do. And here's another example of our um, of the actual framework. And so enduring understandings, those would be the big broad ideas that we want students to achieve. Essential questions, those would be questions that would guide our learning as we go through this work. And then of course we have the students will know these are the particular knowledge pieces and then students will be able to do these are the particular skills that students will have as a result of our learning. And so this particular framework that you see here guides all of our teaching and learning, whether it be in mathematics, social studies, um, in reading and writing, all of those aspects. So then what is it like to teach at MRHE? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of the adults in the school and how our work as an adult learning community really helps drive the work that our students are doing. And so a lot of times, and I've got a few images, let me skip ahead for just a second. To, um, I'm going to come back to those, but I want to share this with you. Um, part of our work as, as an adult group of folks around teaching and learning is that we are constantly having to communicate with each other. To do this work, you have to be able to have strong relationships with the adults in your school. And so part of our work is we have built in required collaboration time where teams are constantly problem solving together. They're talking about individual kids, but they're also collaborating and pushing themselves to continue their own learning. And so the next slide that I'm going to show is around professional development and what this looks like for um, the staff within our school. A lot of times we will spend professional development days or professional development experiences actually consuming and being a part of a museum. And so you'll see a photograph here where several staff members are um, working together, problem solving. This is our leadership team, our museum committee leadership team, which has a representative from each grade level. And then several other folks, our art teacher is a part of that as well. And then the next photograph is an image of um, several of our teachers reading independently at one of our local museums as part of a full day professional development that we did where our teachers actually spent time doing what we hope that they will then do with their students in the classroom. So now that I've explained that a little bit, I'm going to go back. Sorry to hop around on you. But I want to share, actually, I'm going to go forward. I'm going to talk a little bit about promoting creativity. And so as we think about creating an environment of tolerance and acceptance within our school and really providing educational equity, it's very, very important that we give all of our students, regardless of their background, regardless of where they come from, an opportunity to all have shared experiences. And so that's one of the driving factors of this work is how do we create experiences at school that everyone within that school, within that grade level, within that class can participate in and learn from. So they have a common experience. And so part of that is around the idea of promoting creativity, which is then trying to integrate all of the different arts. And so music, actual art pieces, but then also even the physical education piece, and we even incorporate languages into that as well, um, have really proven beneficial by creating that experience for everybody. Part of this work is we also, we all have students who we, we try to reach and we want them, we want to push them to be as exceptional as they possibly can. And this is an opportunity where students who may not be engaged or motivated in the regular classroom are highly engaged and highly motivated during these times where we're actually exhibiting our work or putting our work on display. And so it's an opportunity for students who may not feel connected, who may not feel welcome or um, valued for whatever reason in the school, for them to be a part of the work and for them to feel as though they're, they're a member of the learning community, which is something that's really important when we're talking about creating a school or a system where tolerance 
is a part of that work. This next um, set of images that we have are actually images of one of the exhibits that our students put on. And through this work, we are able to tackle some pretty deep issues um, with our students as part of that critical thinking piece. And so one of our grade levels a few years ago decided to spend some time exploring different issues related to diversity. And so they, they did a study of gender and how that plays out in learning. They also looked at race. They also looked at ability. And you can see several examples of um, the students actually studying sign language as part of, of their work. And so we were pretty proud of, of this particular exhibit. And what happens is we then invite all of our families to come in. And so you can imagine two, 300 people are coming in and are participating in the exhibit that our students created. And our students are there to share with them their learning, but then to also push the learning of the adults who are participating in that. And here's another example of our sixth grade students who um, ended up turning their exhibit into the whole idea of tolerance and um, anti-bullying and supporting students from all backgrounds as they um, are doing their work. And so we were pretty proud of those students who are now in um, high school. And then part of this work is also around character development, which is really more about um, how to be a good citizen and how to treat each other with respect. And so a lot of the work that we do is around how to be respectful, how to be responsible, how to cooperate with others, how to show empathy for someone else. And so we do a lot of this work as we are going through um, the actual exhibit process. And then the next few slides are just several examples of this work and what it actually looks like. And I'm not going to go through every single one of them because I want Mike to have a chance to share with you. But I do want to just point out a couple of things. So this particular photograph that we have here is a model of collaboration. Students are working independently. They're plotting out what they want their work to look like. And they're truly taking leadership for, for their work. Let me go to, um, here's another image of students who are actually designing their exhibit, putting this work together. This is in our art classroom, and you can see that the students are taking complete ownership in their work. They problem solved their work, and now they're putting their model together. <clears throat> here's another photograph of students working with one of their teachers to put together the actual construction part of the exhibit. So again, we're hitting at that inquiry-based learning where students hands-on opportunity in their learning. And then I believe just two more quick photographs of some of our actual final exhibits. So here's an example of an exhibit that was created where students are now coming out and members of the community are there um, and interacting with, with our exhibit. And here's another example that is the map that I was talking about earlier with the geography unit. And as you can see, um, parents are coming in, family members are coming in, and the students are then able to share about their learning and the work that, that they did. And here's another example. And again, just, just to summarize, this has been about 10 years in the making. And so um, it's very important that you take a first step. Um, we're still taking steps and still trying to problem solve to do the very best we can. So I hope you enjoyed that. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Answer, answer questions. Uh, good morning uh, or good evening to you guys. Uh, appreciate you guys joining us today. Uh, this is uh, this is our school here. Uh, we actually share a building uh, with our high school. Uh, 
Uh, so if you're looking at this building, the high school is on the first uh, two floors that you see, and middle school is on floor three. Uh, the picture here is actually all of our students out on the field uh, during homecoming. And uh, we have a uh, drone team here at my middle school that uh, took this picture for us. Uh, so we are School as Expedition. Uh, school of Expedition, there's really two schools of thought uh, here in the States. Uh, one is more of an outbound model or getting kids into nature and allowing them to really learn hands-on uh, in the environment around us. Uh, and that would be on the left-hand side of your screen. On the right-hand side of your screen is more of an expedition through learning and how deep can we go. Uh, so the example on the right is students were allowed to investigate uh, in an engineering unit how do we build a boat that we can then take to our community center and race. Uh, so some of our boats floated, some of our boats did not, uh, but in the end there was a lot of learning that took place. Uh, so school is expedition. Uh, expeditionary learning uh, is tied directly to curriculum. Uh, if we're going to take students out in the field, and whether that's through our uh, tree climbing program or through uh, a, a trip on the river, we want to make sure everything we do is directly tied to our curriculum. Uh, it's going to be standards based. You know, we talk a lot about uh, the state of Missouri where we are, uh, or in the United States, you know, we get mandates as far as what we have to teach to students, um, but there's nothing that says how we have to teach it. Uh, so we get very excited about being creative. Uh, our expeditions, uh, actually, let me stop for a second. So the picture that you see on there is a part of our tree climbing program. Uh, we have a, that's about an 80-year-old red oak that is on our campus, and students may study uh, micro-ecosystems uh, and study different parts of the tree and the micro-ecosystems there. Uh, we may do a physics unit. Uh, last year, we allowed students to bring in pumpkins after they decorated their front porches for Halloween and drop those from different heights in the tree and we were able to study mass and acceleration. Um, so anyway, going back away from the picture, but expeditions can be on campus, uh, they can be day trips, or we actually take students uh, overnight. Uh, I see the very first question we typically get as soon as I get to this point just popped up, um, and that's where do you find the funds for doing this? Uh, we have two really amazing communities that support us. Uh, and we're also, uh, I would say we're very smart with our money. Uh, we don't buy textbooks. The teachers at MRH are curriculum experts. They write their own curriculum, so we're not purchasing textbooks. We're not purchasing curriculum. A lot of our teachers are developing their own curriculum that they deliver in the classroom. Uh, so our expeditions can also be individual. They can be small group, uh, or they can be... Uh, whole grade level. So I'll give you an example of what a on-campus expedition would look like. Uh, this would be, I, I love you too, just saw somebody tell me they love me. Uh, the, the visit to the rain garden, uh, we had an issue a few years back, if you see that fence, the other side of that property belongs to our city. Uh, and every time it would rain, that parking lot would flood this bottom area and then it would come over onto our athletic field. We had some students say, why don't we put a rain garden in? Uh, so we planted uh, a lot of plants through grants uh, and working with our local botanical garden and a, water, a local watershed uh, non-for-profit. And we planted this entire area and we, no, we now no longer have an issue with water coming over onto our field. So that's a benefit, but now the benefit goes year to year educationally because this rain garden is part of an eight year study around pollinators 
and pollinate what pollinators are visiting our campus. So we can tell you with reasonable certainty based on temperature and time of year what our students can tell you what type of pollinators or insects we're going to see around our gardens. So what does it look like to take an expedition around our community? We use a uh, mass transit or our uh, electric train that moves through St. Louis. And our students use that to study human geography. Uh, and we tie that into the colonization of the United States. Um, because when people settled in different areas for specific reasons, we then compare and contrast that by taking our students to study our city on why did people settle in specific areas throughout our city? Uh, and why did they decide to put universities in certain places? Why did they put sporting venues in certain places? Why did they put art in certain places? Uh, and then what does it look like as we take kids overnight? So I tell parents on the first day that I, I'm going to take your kid for four to five days in seventh grade, and I'm going to take them for four to five days in eighth grade. Seventh grade, you'll see the picture on the left. We take them to the Smoky Mountains. Uh, if you ever come to the United States, highly recommend. It's my most favorite place in the world. Uh, but this is a group of students on a geology hike uh, to a place called Spruce Flat Falls. Um, and then I know it's, it's very difficult to read. Uh, when I share the presentation, it should be a little bit easier to see. But all of these are standards and why we're doing every activity. So if we're going on a hike, it's very specific why we're taking that hike. Uh, if we're going to uh, be out in the creek working with kids, it's going to be because we're studying stream physics. Uh, on the right-hand side is our trip to Ocean Springs. Uh, so students go down. We study water from uh, our local watershed to uh, a river that and creeks that run about 30, 40 miles away from here to the Mississippi River, which where all that water heads to. And then that water ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're actually studying the water quality and what type of macroinvertebrates we see from our local watershed all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, another very important part of what we do uh, is the involvement of experts. Uh, so if you look at the left, uh, this gentleman, can you guys see it when I put this pencil on there? Okay, so if you can, okay, this is, okay, cool. So this is Nigel Taylor. Uh, he is a scientist uh, with the uh, Monsanto, and he's studying cassava plants. Uh, and genetically engineer and genetically modifying cassava plants to help villages in Africa. The student on the left, um, I saw Monsanto U. Um, I can tell you that uh, there is definitely some mixed opinion there. I will tell you that they are really good for our students to talk to for research. Uh, so our student on the left was able to meet with uh, Nigel Taylor and actually his passion is understanding, because he didn't want to make a decision whether he was for or against uh, genetically modified or genetically edited plants. Um, so Nigel actually met with him for a half day and allowed him to be a partner in that lab um, so that he could uh, experience what they're doing there. Uh, in the middle uh, is Gregory Sporleader. He is an uh, American actor, uh, has been in over 20 films, uh, one of my favorite films, The Rock. Uh, he was in that movie. He came in and worked with my video production class on putting together a yearbook promo. Uh, and I can tell you that yearbook sales are up. Uh, on the right, uh, this is a geologist at the Tremont Institute in Tennessee, which is about eight hours away from here. Uh, but she is an expert in geology, and all of our students were able to work with her on understanding uh, the geology and erosion in our mountains 
and how the Smoky Mountains were once actually taller than our Rocky Mountains. So it's also about authentic field experiences. Jason talked about uh, opportunities for kids. Uh, in the United States, we hear a lot about the achievement gap. Uh, I prefer to call it an opportunity gap. Uh, so we want to make sure that every single has the same opportunity to either springboard into learning or to reinforce their learning. So if you look here, this is uh, students who are uh, out in our local watershed uh, trying to catch whatever they can and comparing that to water quality. As they move into later in seventh grade, they're out on the Hoosaw River, uh, which is a popular uh, canoe place here in, the, in Missouri doing the same thing to Tremont, Tennessee, uh, where they're doing stream physics and start studying water quality, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, expeditionary learning also provides us an opportunity for in-depth study. Uh, so we have our own beekeepers here on uh, with our student body. We have uh, two adult beekeepers on my staff, uh, but what we do is, if you see, that's actually an ice that's in our outdoor commons, and we had a bee swarm, uh, a couple thousand bees that were sitting on our artwork there. Instead of calling my teachers, uh, I actually called the students, uh, and they went out and actually captured this beehive, or this, I'm sorry, this swarm of bees. About two weeks after that, uh, Dr. Adams called me and said, hey, we've got some bees on our playground. Um, and don't think that like bees are like running rampant in the United States. They're not. Uh, but we had some bees on his playground. We actually sent students over to capture those bees. So then how does that become a part of learning? We can study systems thinking. Uh, we actually produce our own honey, our own beeswax. We make lip balm. Uh, honey, we've made skateboard wax, and then students sell that at our local farmers market so it becomes a part of our economics unit. Uh, and then on the right you're looking at students go out into our gardens, so we have two gardens on our site. Uh, in addition to the gardens we also have our bees which I discussed, we have chickens, uh, and just so you know we're in a very urban area. Uh, if you were to look out our window, we are surrounded by houses, we're surrounded by buildings, and so we have to be very smart with our green space. Uh, but students in this case, they're doing a seed harvest, so we're taking our seeds, making seed packets, uh, doing detailed art drawings, so it's an art integration, and then we provide those seeds to the community through our municipal library and we provide those seeds to the community for free. So when you think about people are building gardens around our community with seeds that we started here at our school, it is really exciting for us. Uh, in addition, we've had uh, some local schools, uh, like Normandy Middle School, Ferguson Middle School, uh, and some elementary schools who not all districts are really excited about doing things like this and don't have the funds for it, so we actually harvest seeds and donate those to the schools. Uh, and then kind of the launch point for us is why do we do all these different things? It's really about how do we differentiate for students. Uh, so as we're approaching a new unit, we look at uh, is that standard that has been assigned to this grade level, is it a content standard, is it a process standard, or is it a product standard? Okay. And if it's a content standard, so uh, example would be in eighth grade studying the branches of government. Okay. We can't change what the branches of government are, but what we can do is talk about the process in which we teach that to students or the product that students show for mastery. So maybe one student does a five paragraph essay while another student creates a video on their computer. 
uh, our concern is mastery, not you know, does every student do the same project to show mastery. From a student point of view, we look at what is the readiness level of students. Uh, not every student that walks into our classroom is at the same level. Um, what is their interest? And what is their learning profile, or how do they, the students learn best? Uh, we can't do this for every single unit. We can't do this for every single lesson, which you really shouldn't. Uh, differentiated instruction should be on a need basis. Uh, I talked about opportunity gap and equity. Uh, you know, in our community, we look at everything from uh, students living in a $400 a month apartment to houses in our district that cost over a million dollars. So when you think about that, we want to make sure every student has the same opportunity to, as I said either earlier, either reinforce learning or springboard into learning. Um, and I think that was my last slide. Uh, one thing I will tell you, uh, I've kind of represented myself here as a principal of our middle school, but I'm also a parent in the district. Uh, I have a son who is in first grade, and he's experiencing the school of studio metaphor. And it's amazing to hear him come home and talk about, uh, you know, hey, Dad, we were talking about uh, thinking about thinking today, and that's called metacognition. Uh, and really cool just to see him grow as a learner and to understand his own thinking, um, but also having these opportunities to talk about healthy eating and be in the gardens. And we have a visiting farm friends where, you know, we, we bring in different animals so that all students can experience that. Uh, and then I have a daughter who is a fifth grader in Dr. Adams' school. And just amazing to see her excited every morning to wake up uh, and experience school as a museum and how excited she is to, you know, call her grandparents who live out of town and say, you're going to come to my museum exhibit, right? Uh, and to hear how she gives up her recess time so that she can work on their museum exhibits and just the excitement of both my kids. So I get excited about coming to work as a principal. But I'm also excited as a parent to see my own two kids experience, uh, you know, the MRH way or the MRH way of learning. Uh, so I'm going to bring Jason back in. And uh, I think, uh, Maha, if this is a point where we can a answer any questions, or um, we'd, we'd be delighted. But, and again, thank you for everybody for joining us. Um, so the question is, are, are there such schools all over the world? Uh, I can answer from a school as expedition perspective. Uh, two years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Atlanta, Georgia, and to an expeditionary school conference. Uh, there was just over 200 schools represented there uh, from across the United States. So our metaphor is not very typical. Uh, we know that. We get that a lot. In, the typical part of expeditionary learning is it's usually part of a uh, an expensive uh, private school or a very at risk, more high school. Um, so we're, we are very unique in having a whole school that does school as expedition. But I think it's very fitting just knowing, uh, having these kids out and working together, knowing that they're going through so many changes in their life. Uh, both physically uh, and socially. And then for schools as a museum, um, there are several schools as a museum around the United States. Um, I'm not necessarily sure about outside of the United States, but inquiry-based learning, or I even saw someone mention PBL or problem-based learning or project-based learning, are all very similar. And a lot of these approaches are happening in schools all across the world. We've just packaged it in a way within our school's museum metaphor. Yeah. Uh, so one of the questions just that just came through is, do we have any final exams? Uh, 
We do have end of grade level uh, standardized testing from the state of Missouri. Uh, I can tell you that uh, 15 years ago, we were one percentage point away from being taken over by the state. Uh, in the last uh, two, three years, we've consistently averaged uh, 97, 98 percent on our school report cards for the district. Um, so definitely, you know, approaching that whole child from preschool through high school, uh, I think has had a definite effect on the improvement across our entire district. And at the elementary level, we still have standardized tests. We, we have to do all of those things as part of our um, the expectation for us. Um, but we're trying to make the learning part of it um, as engaging as possible um, for our students. Okay. Uh, Joanna, we have done some work at the middle school uh, with other middle schools. About two years ago, we uh, not every student is involved in this, but we started a group called 6-1, uh, and it was six middle schools that came together to talk about uh, race and opportunity and just different social issues that were happening in uh, the St. Louis area or in the United States in general. Um, so that was one opportunity we've had, but to actually compare uh, the results of a specific academic unit we have not done. Uh, we are currently, our middle school will be one of 10 schools across the United States that is going to be studied around green practices and how are we integrating gardens and uh, sustainability and environmental education and how are we integrating in that to our general curriculum. So we're very excited about that. Sure. So there's a question about um, students with, with disabilities. And our goal, our motto has been that every student should participate, regardless of, of their ability or perceived ability. Everyone should participate. And so the degree to which everyone participates may look different, depending on the need of the child. But we want everyone engaged in the process. We want everyone engaged in the learning. And that's important as we work with our students to make sure that they're including everyone, that everyone has an opportunity to share their voice, to share their perspective, and to have some say and some work within our exhibit work that we do. I appreciate that question. Thank you. Yeah, and if I could answer that from a expedition standpoint, uh, we average 95 to 98 percent of our students attending uh, overnight expeditions. Um, so we have had uh, to give you an example, we're getting ready to head out to Tremont, Tennessee with our seventh graders. Uh, we will actually differentiate what that looks like for some of our students with disabilities. So I have one student who uh, has, some, has some vision problems and some motor skill issues. Um, so we will pick a different trail for that student. Uh, maybe a less rigorous trail where there's not as much up and down or uh, more stable footing for that student. So he's still going to be able to experience all that science and living history that we study. It's just going to be on a different trail and we'll have, we'll, but we'll still have peers that go with him. Any other questions for us? Joanna, I just saw your link. I'll make sure that I uh, check yeah, that out. It's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, could we imagine any cooperation with Polish schools? Uh, we're always open to opportunities. Uh, you know, if it, it fits your model and what you're wanting your students to learn, and for us, if it if it fits with you know what we're wanting to do with our students and what and what we need to get our students to do, uh, we're always open listening to ideas. Uh, somebody asked about the cost of the trips. Uh, always comes up. 
uh, again, most of those, most of it is funded by our school district. Uh, we do charge a small expedition fee each year for students. Uh, when I say small, it's fifty dollars per student, uh, which is very, very uh, reasonable. One of the reasons why we keep that so low is we want to make it uh, so that every family can contribute. Um, and and also feel equal to all the other families and what they're contributing to their child's education. Uh, we felt that that's very important for us. Um, so I saw the one question is should parents pay for the trips themselves? Uh, I would have a hard time with that because I think that would immediately exclude. Uh, as Jason said, 45% of our students receive some type of lunch assistance. Uh, so, I think we would immediately eliminate uh, quite a few students uh, from the opportunity. And then there's a question about students who are homeless. Yes, all of our students participate um, regardless of the background, regardless of the family. It's our goal that everyone have a common shared experience within our school. And we um, I've paid for kids myself. I know Mike has paid for kids. Um, we have families within our community who will pay for their child and also pay for another child. And so a lot of that collaboration and that network has been created over the last few years. But it's, it's kind of like we cross our fingers and hope that every year it ends up turning out and it always does. And we always seem to find a way to be able to support all of our kids in participating in these opportunities. Yeah. Uh, so I see Maha, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, uh, asked about, said Roxana talked about homeless students that live in our schools and what about them? Uh, so those students are actually part of our high school, uh, but I can tell you that the high school looks at it very much the same and that those are still our students and we're going to give them every opportunity as possible. Uh, and then the other question I saw was, uh, objections from parents that are demanding academic learning. Uh, I would say that it is academic learning, it just looks different. Uh, and it you know, really is a very engaging way for students. So again, you know, we're going to be making sure that the students have mastery of standards, but how we get students to master that is just very different. You know, if, you know, I have a, if I have a decision to make of do I buy a textbook for students so that they can understand physics or can I take them out and allow them to tree climb and actually experience physics? I'm going to choose the tree climbing every day. And if we have a parent who is concerned about it or wants to know more, we just invite them in, come and spend some time with us as our kids are doing the learning. And I've yet to have anyone after that experience continue the question about the academic rigor of what we're doing. And Maya, sorry about that. Thank you yeah, for helping Yeah, my apologies. Us. Any other questions? Lots of people typing. <laughs> what was it? You missed oh. It. Oh. Uh, so does does he have to take part in all outside classes which he is not interested in? Uh, yes. <laughs> so if we're doing something, we're doing something outside, it is going to be directly tied to one of the standards that students need to master. Uh, usually, to be honest, I can't think of the last time I've had a student say, I'd rather stay in the classroom and do a worksheet instead of going outside and you know studying something hands-on. You're welcome. And Anna, to your question, um, I don't want to speak for Mike, but I think we would probably both be willing to connect sometime in the future. 
um, I think we would both be willing to continue this, this partnership and our collaboration together. And we have a lot to learn from you as well. Uh, what about bullying? Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think that there's a, a school in the world uh, that can say that they're 100% bully free. Um, what we do is, uh, Jason's done a lot of work through uh, character education here, um, and then I've done a lot of work through what we call restorative practices, um, and really getting kids to sit down and talk about it. So if I have a situation where maybe a student's being mistreated, uh, I want to bring those students together and actually have them talk through it. Because um, it's really easy as an administrator just to drop the hammer and say, hey, you know what, you're going to go to our in-school suspension for two days, and then it's just, then I don't have to deal with it for two days. But at some point, we have to get those kids together and make sure that they can repair that relationship because they're going to be together for the next four, five, six years through our school system. Um, and we want to make sure that, we, that those relationships are healthy. Um, so is there, you know, is there mistreatment or bullying in our schools? There are. I think that it's you know, every school, but it's how we handle it and how we repair those relationships that matter. And I agree with, with everything that Mike said. I would add to that that a lot of the research, whenever you talk about bullying and look at bullying, there's a degree of not feeling included or feeling a part of, of the work that's happening, both on the part of the bully and the, the part of the victim. And that's really one of the, the positives of this work is to try to get everyone involved. Everyone has a role. Everyone is, is a member of our learning community. And yes, we do problem solve with individual kids. We, we do have situations. But that's part of the goal is to try to keep everyone as positive and involved in learning as possible. And then Joanna, you asked a question about do we cooperate with Boy Scouts? Yes. Um, we've actually had, um, <laughs> sorry, we just saw Marta's yeah. comment. Um, we do cooperate and work with um, outside organizations. We've had Girl Scouts, we've had parents, we've had Boy Scouts, we've had museums who have come in and who have worked with different exhibits that we've done. They've participated in the construction or they've done um, extension activities with our school gardens and with our school chickens as part of their work that they're doing. Um, so we very much have a good relationship with our outside communities um, and um, outside community support systems that we have like the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts. Uh, do we involve parents as coaches or specialists? Uh, we do bring uh, parents on our trips with us. Uh, it, it's interesting when they started these trips uh, 12, 13 years ago, uh, it was definitely a shift in thinking and it was sometimes difficult to get enough parents to go. Um, unfortunately, now it's a good problem to have but we're actually having to say no to some parents that want to attend these trips, whether it's uh, because we don't have room on the buses or the place we're going has limited housing. Uh, but the last thing I want to do is turn away parents. Uh, but there's a good problem right now in that we actually, you know, the trip that we're taking to Ocean Springs, Mississippi here soon, uh, I had to say no to a couple parents. and But the parents know that it's no for this trip, but I'm going to try to get them on another one because um, I want them to experience how their kids are learning because they're going to be our best advocates um, when it comes to uh, the community and somebody says, why are they taking these trips? We want parents to be able to step up and say, you know, these are all the reasons why. Um, I think to answer your question about school breaks, 
I think everybody enjoys the break, but what what exciting for me is what Mike shared about his daughter. Um, I think kids do want to come back to school, um, want to be involved in the learning, and um, it's not a place that they necessarily dread coming to or don't want to come to. I think they enjoy the experience and view our schools as a safe place um, for them. Joanna, I just saw your um, question. Yes, we, um, we've invited several parents to come in. I think Mike as part of his work. Um, and so, yes, we would continue to have um, parents come in and, and do part of the work and actually talk with kids and share with them how they use their learning in, in their actual professions and what they do. OK, thank you very much. I know you can talk and talk about your work, and that was great. Really, really, thank you. I dziękuję bardzo wszystkim uczestnikom. Mam nadzieję, że się podobało. I hope you enjoyed and and what what else I can say? Webinar will be recorded. Dlatego jeszcze będzie szansa wróci, wrócenia do tekstu. Ten link z Google, do dokumentu Google też prześlemy, bo on pewnie gdzieś tam w czacie zanik zanikł, więc żeby Państwo mieli, mieli dostęp do materiałów, jak najbardziej prześlemy. Jeszcze raz dziękuję, a wszystkie pytania dotyczące kolejnych webinariów proszę przesyłać do Mai Dobiasz. Na pewno chętnie odpowie, jakie są dalsze plany. Thank you very much one more time and uh, bye. Have a nice evening. Thank you, you too. Thank you.